where you hire the talent from, what conducive work environments you create for them, what flexibility you create for them, and what ways of working you create for them. Some people st stopped showing up after a few <laughs> sessions thinking that he'll go away. He's the group CEO of Rack Bank. Well, I've known Rahil for, I guess, a little bit uh, under a year. He was very kind to invite me to one of your events. In a market like the UAE, where one could argue that there is possibly possibly over banking in terms of mm -hmm. just the number of banks, yeah. right? Do you see a place for these pure play digital banks to come thrive? Just because you're big and you're incumbent today doesn't mean that you will be existing five years from now. Welcome to today's episode of Couchonomics with Arjun. Uh, we're sort of early in season three. Joining me on the couch is the group CEO of Rack Bank. Rahil, um, Rahil, uh, well, I've known Rahil for, I guess, a little bit uh, under a year. He was very kind to invite me to one of your events, uh, which you had hosted at the Coca-Cola Center. Um, obviously, known Rack Bank very well. Um, in my past life, I had the opportunity to do some work with uh, Rack Bank, but that's before Rahil took over when I was with Alpha Team. But having said all that, I'd like to welcome Rahil to the couch. Rahil, thank you for coming in. Pleasure is all mine, Arjun. Thank you for inviting me. You, you were actually going to be our our season-ending uh, bonanza episode last year, but unfortunately, you were unwell at that time. So I was quickly to I was quick enough to grab you before we got too late into this season. Uh, so thank you for making it, Ray. Let mm -hmm. me first start with congratulating you. I, I was uh, I was earlier today. I was just going through the results for 2023. I think if I got the numbers right, I think 1.8 billion dirhams in in net profit, which is up over 55 or 56 percent from, I guess, the year before. Uh, should I be asking what what's the secret sauce here? Uh, listen, I think I think every bank has done very well, right? So I don't. Uh, uh, feel very bloated about the results but uh, for us uh, it was a it was a story of i think three m's uh, mix macro momentum so one we have been diversifying our product range uh, and <clears throat> the mix of business that we are getting is uh, is uh, quite different to what we had pre covid uh, second is momentum we have real good momentum on all our products services segments and the third is that the macro environment and the interest rate environment has been really, really conducive, I think, to all banks. And I think everybody is benefiting from that. So, so I think that sort of beckons the question, right? So if I just take a state step back and, and if I request you to sort of step, mm -hmm. maybe not out of your sort of hat of being a CEO of, of Rack Bank, where, what is the state of banking, I guess, in the UAE? And if I may sort of take, take, the, take, take the opportunity in the wider GCC, you know, what's yeah. working really well? Where do you think there are certain opportunities for banks to, to, I guess, get better? What's your take on that? Yeah, so I think the state of banking has evolved. I mean, just you may not know this, but my first assignment in UAE was in 1993 with Citibank. So no, I I, I, my first uh, first time I stepped in a bank here was 30 years ago. So I have some history, uh, and this is my fourth time back in the UAE. The there are I think three things that I found have significantly uh, been enhanced. And I think largely driven by regulators, some driven by banks. Uh, the first is, I think, the, the regulatory focus on customer protection and the bringing the customer into the picture. So I think the central bank has done a really good job in creating the pre customer protection framework, getting it implemented, and now monitoring it. So I think that's really good from a sustainability of the industry perspective. Secondly, naturally, financial crime and uh, money laundering, KYC, so, so the whole financial crime regulation for banks and for movement of money in general, I think has uh, really seen a transformational uh, enhancement. Creates a lot of opportunity, right? Data, AI, how you manage it, because it's a scale game there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think the third is innovation, right? So the industry is uh, uh, innovating, uh, we we have the, the the central bank again pushing open finance, lots of other things, e darham, so on and so forth. So so I think there's been quite a lot of innovation which is benefiting the consumer as well. So so if if I just take on that and and, and let's just potentially pick up maybe the last bit around mm -hmm. which is innovation, right? If you look at the next five years, 
what according to you are sort of the trends which keep you most preoccupied and your management team most preoccupied in terms of not just running the bank but advancing the bank if I may sort of say so. So listen, our fundamental uh, premise is that we think about the customer and the customer's needs, right? Uh, When I came in here on 1st January 2022, Jenny, I did not at least exist in the hype that it is existing right now. Uh, Today, everybody's talking about it, you know, so who knows what the technology of the future will be? Who knows how quickly what we are building now and calling transformation will become completely obsolete? So I think if you stay focused on where is the customer's mind and what are the customer's need, that is one. I also think that we have to build uh, very dynamic, liquid organizations with the right people in them. Mm -hmm. Because change is going to be the only constant. And while it, that that, word, that phrase has been said for a long time, I think from a mental preparedness of change being a constant and people having to continuously think about how to do things in a different way all the time is not something that comes very easily. Right? So I think that's, uh, that's number two. And number three that I say to my team is uh, you are in infinite games, not finite games, right? So... The, the rules of the game are going to change midway. The, you know, the, the goalpost will change. The, the competition will change. And you have to be ready for that. So, so I think from that perspective, for me, culture uh, and, uh, and, and the, sort of the agility of the team that you build, I think perhaps is the most important thing that keeps me awake. Because I think if I don't get it right, we will be slow to react when the customer preference or a technology changes. If I can have that right, then I think everything else can fall in place. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about AI. I'm yeah. definitely not going to talk about blockchain because I think, we, you know, we, anyone can press Google and, yeah. you know, stuff will come out. I do want to ask a little bit more around this whole cultural thing because I think you've brought it up. You brought it up very early in this conversation, yeah. right? So, so let's talk about it. So, Rahil, without sort of spilling the secrets here, how, how do you do it? Because it, I, I have to be honest with you. Majority of your peers will also say that, you know, the, uh, the, the liquid organization might not be something that everybody says, but I think culture and the importance that comes in. What do you do differently or what are you trying to do differently or uniquely, if I may use that term, to get that sort of culture right? Yeah. And what's the North Star to the culture? I, I appreciate customer centricity being one, but what's the North Star against which that you build that culture or the template against which you're building? Yeah, so... Um- so my, I, I don't have a magic answer with here are the top three or the top yeah. five things I do. I think it's a lot of small things that come together, right? I think it's from celebrating diversity of views, you know, being able to have one uh, person, one vote in the room, regardless of how junior or senior they are, letting ideas flow very fluently from top to bottom and bottom to top, having a culture where fear does not exist in being able to disagree with something. And you have to practice that. You have to preach that. Even if you give people permission, people f- usually feel that yes, it's, it's it stays somewhere in a in a mantra somewhere on on your vision statement. But if, if I actually do it, it's not going to be real. So you have to live it. You have to breathe it. And uh, I mean, I when I came in here, my first meeting was an agile squad meeting uh, where they were, we were building a new account opening journey. And I attended all 52 weekly stand-ups of that, uh, of that squad, right? Uh, I didn't have to, but it was symbolic uh, that this is really, really important and this is how we work and we bring cross-functional teams together and then, then we stick with it. Uh, some people st- stopped showing up after a few <laughs> sessions thinking that he'll go away, he's not going to be, you know, this is far too, um, for, as a, at a CEO level, this is, this is not going to be important for him. But I stuck it out, right? And then, then it slowly starts permeating in the organization. So I think you have to walk the talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel that many senior leaders do it. Many senior leaders don't. And, uh, and I think that's, that's where the culture starts to break. Okay. So diversity of thought, right? Let me try mm-hmm. and bring a couple of sort of contexts on that. So what is the most classical diversity? Um, you know, how do we actually get more women to banking and financial services? We'll come to that. But let me ask you the first one in terms of diversity of thought. Bankers have typically been known to only hire fellow bankers, right? Uh, You you seek comfort in familiarity. And again, I don't think bankers should be blamed. Everybody does that. I'm I'm a consultant by living. You put two CVs in front of me. If the person has done a few years of consulting prior to, 
them uh, applying to us, the person is given a bit of a nudge in any case. I, I, I don't want to get into trouble mm-hmm. with my HR uh, uh, function, but that does happen. How do we actually break away from that thinking? Firstly, do you really think that diversity of thought is welcomed among banks from non-bankers on a full-time basis? Yeah. Uh, and secondly, if that is so, how do you attract that talent in? So uh, interesting you say that. So when one of our KPIs that is that we will hire fifteen percent non-bankers every year, mm. right? So it's part of it's wow. baked okay. in our resourcing strategy, because I am a very very firm believer. I think we all are as our management team that we need diversity of thinking. And if you just keep hiring people who look and feel and think like you, you're not going to get it, right? So we go and search for people who have no relevant experience in banking. And we go and uh, look at where the fit could be and then, then go and talk to them. Right? So a training and development manage, manager came from Emirates Airlines. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so we, 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 there's lots of examples I can give you, uh, but we definitely have that as a KPI because I think that drives very, very different thinking. Uh, so, 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 yeah, I mean, at least at, least at Drag Bank, we, we preach it, we believe it, and we actually measure it and quantify it because if we don't, then you will shift the, the the natural mindset is exactly what you said. So we measure it and, and, and we quantify it and we give ourselves targets to do it. What about getting greater <coughs> diversity in terms of gender diversity into, into the banking sector or the wider financial sector? And this is not just about Rack Bank. How do yeah. we just do it for the entire sector? Yeah, so, uh, and again, you know, I, I used to be the diversity and inclusion head for Barclays where there were okay. 48,000 people. Here I've got a much smaller team and it's it's the, the shape of the diversity is the same. At the junior level, you have many, many more female uh, employees or colleagues, as we call them. Uh, I think we are at 59%. Right? Okay. You come to senior level, we are at 21%. Again, in our strategy, we have said by the time in the next three to four years, we want to be 50% senior management's female. When, when I came in, we were at 45 nationalities. We are at 61 nationalities now. So we look at diversity in multiple angles, right? We are also living di- diversity from a you know, how do we get a people of determination in, right? Because they bring some very creative skills that that perhaps we don't. Uh, But I think you have to look at, uh, one is where you hire the talent from, uh, what conducive work environments you create for them, what flexibility you create for them, and what ways of working you create for them. It's not easy, but but, uh, I think we can get there. Uh, We are uh, actively now pursuing, uh, you know, technology is one area where, I still continue to be surprised, but technology and data, uh, you don't find enough female senior leaders. So we are now actively pursuing and actively focusing on, uh, you know, getting gender diversity in those two areas. No, and I think it's important. I think if you can get a few, I guess, beacons of successes across the across the wider financial services sector, I think it will propel the entire sector, right? Because uh, I, 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 I'm I, a father of two daughters. Not, I'm not suggesting either one of them want to be bankers in the future because I have no clue what they want to be. But I do want to actually see that we are not just talking about these things and we're actually doing something about it, right? Mm-hmm. And it's good to hear. I, I think the fact that you actually have hard targets, yes. right? That itself is, is actually, I think, yes. it's a step in the right direction. I have no idea how many other banks do, yes. but I think if they don't, I think they should consider it. Yeah. In terms of technology, right? So, so as you mentioned, there are a number of things going on, right? Uh, macro, there's technology which is evolving. The regulator is becoming, uh, I guess, more harmonious in terms of they want to progress the ecosystem. We have, uh, you know, we have uh, a consumer behavior and trend which is also driving us. There's a very interesting phenomena which we're starting to see, which is new business models emerging, mm-hmm. right? So there's a lot of rhetoric around yeah. embedded finance right now. I, I think there is great potential in it, but you know, for the party, everybody's got to come together. And that's why I say, you know, the other thing is banking as a service, banking as a platform. What's your sort of view as a CEO in terms of do you see banks evolve their business models, launch new businesses? Uh, which are complementary, but they're more technology-led. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your thinking on that, especially specifically <coughs> for the region? Yeah, so I, um, listen, I think in five years, banks will get deconstructed and reconstructed and will exist in, in components and exist in parts. And yes, you will have some of those parts being called the core bank. And then you will have many multiple... Uh, things. I mean, we were just looking at something as simple as how many external APIs do we have to consume to serve our customers. And I think uh, even if I don't count the very small ones, we are already up to 85 or 90, right? 
uh, that means I'm consuming somebody else's capability or, or a technology to, to be able to serve my customer. So the ecosystem, I think, is going to get very disaggregated, mm-hmm. uh, both from banks and from our own technology. We build uh, Most banks build technology for themselves. I think, again, technology as a service, we could be building quite a lot of things that we could then make available for fintechs or for other firms as well, right? I think especially on compliance, on identity, on KYC, um, banks have a lot of capability that they could they could actually uh, distribute much more widely. So I do see that over the next five to ten years, yes, new business models will emerge. I think the definition of what a bank does will will change, right? I think it will be a much broader ecosystem than what it is today. Uh, I think it will it will perhaps be anything to do with money and wherever it goes you could start there and then you could sort of define anything inside that. So, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I think we are heading in that direction. It's bound to happen. And how you deconstruct the company and construct it in a way that you can disassemble and assemble it, I think is very important for us at RagBank because if we organize ourselves that way, then again, going back to the liquid organization, you also have a liquid company that can sort of redesign itself pretty quickly without having to you know, go back all the way to the foundation, then demolish the core. No, that's very interesting. And as you can see, I'm slipping the conversation slowly towards fintech, but we'll take mm-hmm. one more stop before we get into the whole fintech piece. Sure. Digital banks, right? Mm-hmm. And and I am talking about native digital banks, yeah. not necessarily yeah. the digital attackers which have come out of existing banks, which some might call out digital front ends and so on and so forth. In a market like the UAE, where one could argue that there is possibly possibly over banking in terms Mm -hmm. of just the number of banks, right? Do you see a place for these pure play digital banks to come thrive and actually become formidable in terms of their influence? Or are they just purely going to play the role of a disruptor, which is they'll make people like me aware of, hey, there's actually a cool app and things can be done a lot better. And then me starting demanding my incumbent banks to say, do this for me because this is what my men knew. Where do you sit on this? Yeah, so see, I never put uh, the incumbent versus the challengers in two different buckets. Right? Okay. Uh, look at the top 20 companies on NYSC 20 years ago versus now, right? You most probably won't recognize 90% mm-hmm. of them. So I think just because you're big and you're incumbent today doesn't mean that you will be existing five years from now, right? Um, so I think I think I, I keep uh, saying that we are all in survival mode, regardless mm-hmm. of how small or how big you are, mm-hmm. right? So I think the differentiation. Yes, you may have a little bit more uh, breathing room till till your survival mode ends, but but I think everybody is in that. So everybody has to keep on their toes, and I think it's the it's the companies that can sustain themselves, have a clear business model, have a clear customer proposition that is value added will win. Sometimes we create, sometimes you see a lot of hype, right? And can come from an incumbent and can come from a new player, but that's what it is, right? I, I know a lot of, uh, not, not only here, across the world, right? A lot of companies that call themselves digital, the, the only thing digital is the front end screen <laughs> to the customer, right? Everything then d- drops back to paper. Mm. And then the paper starts and all the, all the issues with the paper that happen today with incumbents also happen there. Some of them are just really good UX, UI, but some are genuinely doing really, really good stuff. Mm-hmm. So so I think that's one, right? I think the second thing is trust. I was going to come to you. <clears throat> right? And trust, I think, is underrated in the finance community by the banks and perhaps even by the fintechs and perhaps overrated by the customer. Right? Um, I think, and, and you know, our sort of mantra is we have the digital bank with a human touch because we feel that any customer uh, would like to be able to access a human being regardless of how digitally savvy they are and how cool your app is when they need to. And there could be multiple reasons for doing that. Uh, I don't know if it's true now, but two years ago, I read a study that in the larger markets uh, in the world, the proportion of deposit share is still directly correlated with the number of branches. And that's not because people go to the branch, but knowing that there is a place I can walk into if something goes wrong is a very big determining factor, especially if you're keeping your own money. Maybe if you're lending, you're less worried about um, where where, Where where you're getting from. from. 
Uh, and I think that comes back to trust, right? So I think if you create trust, I think if you create reliability, and I think reliability gets created in moments of stress and moments of when things go wrong, right? How do you react? How do you manage how, how that happens? And I think the banks that do it well will, will thrive. Um, is the UA overbanked for 5 million consumers? Yes, it is, right? Because a lot of these uh, new technologies, pure play, uh, are built for scale. And you have to really think about where your scale will come from. Uh, so I think either they widen to GCC or they widen to a market segment that is that is much bigger. Naturally, the population here is increasing, and I think that will continue to grow. But how much space that creates for how many players to do the same thing, I think that remains a challenge. And I don't think there has been one player that has been able to say today that they can they have consolidated so much market share that now they have become, you know, invincible. Yeah, I know. I agree with you. So two thoughts. One, I think I just have to confirm. So I was very, very fortunate uh, late last year at the Singapore FinTech Festival. I actually ran a closed door uh, uh, roundtable with, if I'm not wrong, there was 14 or 15 digital bank CEOs mm -hmm. from across the world. The title of the, sh uh, the, the conversation was Why Digital Banks Fail. Now, I, I thought it was uh, it, it was quite emotive because the question was not about fail. It was like, why is it taking them so much time to make money? And, and, and what came across quite fundamentally across the table was the trust factor. Yeah. They said trust takes time, yeah. right? And I think you, you made this very interesting analogy between number of branches uh, to, to, to deposits. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 again, I can't validate or disagree with you, but I think one, th one thing we did come out of that conversation was that a combination of access, track record, and longevity, yeah. right, has an influence on someone taking his li his or her life savings and putting it into a bank, right? And I think that that sort of to me, I'm sure there are other factors in the trust factor also. Having said that, then how do these sort of new age banks go about? And I'm sure you know you don't want to give your your competitors a trick of the trade here, but. My question here is, how do they overcome this trust issue? Because th this could take a very, very long time. And unfortunately, we live in an environment where capital isn't very patient, especially the, the capital which is finding its way into these so-called digital banks. How does this play out? Yeah, so I think some of it is the longevity, right? I wouldn't, uh, I, I would be lying if I said it wasn't. But I think it's also the sequencing of what you start with and how you do it. I think... Sometimes, and again, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work in Asia and Europe. Uh, you know, I was there when open banking got launched in the UK. Okay. Very interesting insights from that as well. What happened to the incumbents versus the neo banks, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think sometimes these uh, new players uh, price themselves out by becoming the cheapest in the easiest thing to do, mm -hmm. right? And Perhaps sometimes, and again, I'm not generalizing, okay, so because there, there, there's, there's some very creative and very amazing banks that have that have started. Um, and and they, they, they pursue the easiest option, which perhaps has the lowest margin, and then you run out of bandwidth at some point in time, you know. Uh, and and then if the next round of funding doesn't come, then, then, then you're in trouble, right? Uh, I think in UK, it was very interesting. I mean, I lived through that whole paradigm. I mean, Barclays was a very large bank where I was working at that time. And despite open banking, despite uh, this whole uh, almost effort to say we have to break the monopoly of the big five, when I, l when I went there in 2015, I think the share of mortgages of the big five bank was 63%. When I left, it was 69%. <laughs> and in that time, they had issued, I think, dozens of licenses for new digital banks. Open banking had come in, and it, it was pretty unfavorable because, you know, mm -hmm. only the top 10 banks had to give away their transaction data, and anybody, anybody almost could consume it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, because, you know, there's capital involved, there is risk involved, there's compliance involved, and sometimes perhaps what happens is that the thin layer that is built is built on the wrong premise of how much operating cost and energy you need to really run a proper full digital bank. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, uh, you look at how much money is lying in wallets these days, right? And you, you worry uh, or look at data privacy and data security. 
uh, it takes one big event to happen when suddenly a regulator may realize to say, oops, you know, billions of dollars got wiped out because they were lying in somebody's digital wallet, mm-hmm. which we were not uh, regulating, right? Um, so I think I think all those things have to be thought of early, and I think perhaps the business case is a bit longer than sometimes it's meant to be. So, so here's my dilemma, right? And, and hopefully I'm able to construct this uh, question uh, coherently and, and sensibly. So here, here's my attempt at it. Uh, I do believe that that I think when you, you, you use the New York Stock Exchange as an example, I think the one fundamental difference is we're talking about a sector which is regulated. Yeah. And so therefore flux is a little less, a yes. uh, little lesser than pure technology players, mm-hmm. right? Because, you know, you, you, you live and die by your last dance, arguably in technology. So you have banks, they're doing incredibly well, right? Uh, I'm talking about the GCC. Uh, there is this premise that we are overbanked mm-hmm. or we have too many banks. You have the disruptors who arguably either don't have the best business models for obvious reasons or, you know, the cost of their operation in terms of the cost of capital and, and the capabilities are limited. How do we sort of address where I still think this market is underserved? I think your bank is one which initially and to date still focuses on what I call the micro and small businesses. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're well served even mm-hmm. today in this sort of over over banked market. How does that ever get solved? Like, why would banks want to do it? Yeah. I think that's a good question. I think uh, uh, there are underserved markets. You mentioned micro SMEs. Uh, there is the whole microfinance segment, you know, the the the, and you know we we have just started doing that as well, and I think there is a lot of need to to serve those segments better and serve those segments well, and I think there are very good bolt bolt on capabilities that many of the fintechs, the data techs, if there's that's that's a word, bring to the table, where you can use uh, newer ways of uh, assessment of risk, right? Because I think from a payments and deposits perspective, because those are the easier parts of the regulated sector. Those are being served well. If not by banks, then, you know, there's there's multiple layers of players, including fintechs, that do a very good job at it. Uh, so the easier parts of banking, which are less regulated, but I think the ones where risk comes in, compliance comes in, uh, the models have to evolve. The documentation has to evolve. So, you know, people are asking me about VAT and now corporate tax. I think that will be a blessing, right? Because uh, because some of these companies, and again, the financial sector has to mm-hmm. has to play its part. But uh, they will be able to get documented, and the more documented they will be, the more well served they will become. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. And if I now bring the conversation to fintechs, yes. right? Open question: What's your take on the fintech sector? Sort of maybe a decade or you know eight years into it now. Uh, how do you how do you sort of rate it? My, my personal opinion, I'll just say it. I'll put it on the table. Two, two or three things. One is, as I said at at the Sharjah uh, uh, Entrepreneurship Week last week, that I think too many fintechs read the David versus Goliath story mm-hmm. and decided that they all could be David. Yeah. It, reality is very different. Secondly, I still believe that overall fintech sector is very very shallow. Right, I, I'm not seeing as much deep tech as I would expect for them to be disruptive. I I, I love all the BNPL guys and the work mm-hmm. they're doing, but I think the sector has to mature out it. Thirdly, I actually don't see much collaboration. Right, I do see bits and pieces of collaboration, but there's no active collaboration between the banks and fintechs that we can actually write stories about. So with that sort of the background, I just want to hear Rahil's view, or the CEO of Rack Bank's view on how do, how does he see the sector in fintech? How do you guys see yourself collaborating with them, if at all? Yeah, so I th- I think that I think it's uh, I see it very positively. I think that it is uh, it is bringing some very very new ideas, some very disruptive thinking to the industry, and I think uh, that is, if nothing else, driving the incumbents to be much more thoughtful of what they can do. Right? I think the qu- and and I I definitely see them. I definitely see, and I saw that in the UK as well, where I was there. It it sort of started with competition, and then it became collaboration, and from you know enemies to frenemies, and so on and <laughs> so forth. Right, whatever words you want to use, and I think that is how it will evolve here as mm-hmm. well. Right, and it is evolving. I think many, uh, you know, I think how we think about fintechs and their collaborations with the banks, um, I think is understated, because for a lot of things we use a lot of interesting. Uh, financial technologies that 
that are coming from small companies or new startups, uh, but they plug into our ecosystem in a way that perhaps you don't see their names on 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 top of the can. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean they don't exist. I mean, we use a very very good company. Again, I won't name companies. Uh, for reading uh, statements and making sense of them for for making credit decisions, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we are using a lot of the government provided technology as well. So so I think the 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 coordination and the collaboration will will absolutely happen and will absolutely continue. I think it's more for the fintechs to understand where the bank's pain points are. Uh, and if they want to play to augment that and then be the collaborators and then naturally they can go and plug into multiple banks ecosystems or whether they want to take something head on and say, no, listen, we think we can do it much better and we, we are going to be a standalone and we will play. And I, I sometimes find that that clarity is not there. Mm-hmm. Right. So you have a great idea and you are not still clear that whether I'm, I'm going to take that idea into a product that I want to market myself or is it a capability or or or, or something that I can go and uh, collaborate with somebody and then make it work? No, right. fair enough. And but but my question, so I so I, I come back. But so, do you hear this from your peers, or are you the exception to the rule in terms of banks really willing and open to collaborate? Because. Uh, Really, if I if I if I just be honest, having been on the the fintech side myself, mm-hmm. right? A lot of banks still prefer to have the master servant type of relationship with the fintech, which basically relegates them to a technology provider, yeah. right? Fintechs want to thrive; they don't always want to c- compete with you because they're B two B infrastructure players who yeah. will not have a brand, right? They're not going to put anything on the cans, and they wouldn't but. But are the banks willing to to accept that the future of banking and the future of their business models, and I mean the big big guys and sort of the smaller guys, is going to be sort of co-created with fintechs? Second part of the question is that are you going to see or are you, are you, do you foresee that more and more of the banks will start to participate in creating this fintech ecosystem by either putting their dollars out there through the, you know, uh, CVC funds or, or, you know, buying out some fintechs without killing them entirely, but, you know, letting mm-hmm. them sort of run on their own, but using them. Do you see all of that happening here? And obviously your UK, UK example would be yeah. great, right? For you to kind of use that as a reference point. Yeah, I, I, I do see that happening. Okay. Right. I think do see that happening. I think for that to happen, one, naturally the sector needs to mature the, especially if you're using it as a venture capital arm, then the question goes back to where is the scale, where is the monetization, where is the where, where is the business case to do this, right? And uh, you have 10.2 million, 10.3 million people here. Half of them are, you know, in, in, in the sort of the non-bankable or the microfinance sector. So <clears throat> what is that new thing that you bet on which you think can scale, and if you're if it's something that is a, you know that can be scaled multi-country, then that absolutely that makes sense, and uh, so I think that will definitely happen. I think uh, it will. Or, I think banks are genuinely interested, not in a master servant, but but to co-create, uh, and these things are happening more and more. At least I see it. I don't see it only in our bank. Uh, I see it more. I'm seeing it more in compliance and risk and regulation. I, you, you know, you'd be, and maybe they're perhaps again understated firms, but <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff we are doing. There's a lot of good in, stuff in there. in risk and compliance, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, now the, with the, the climate risk is coming. You know, there's the, again lots of good good companies that exist which can complement what banks are doing. So, I do see this evolving, and I do see this working. And you know, when 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 again in the UK, you see. A, Many big banks are integrating with capabilities being provided by by a fintech, uh, uh, are complementing their offering with what a fintech is doing. Right? So while talking, mm-hmm. I just had a bit of a a, a, a memory thought. I mm-hmm. remember when I think you were the chair of the UAE Banking Federation. I, I, I'm, right. I'm assuming you have moved on from that chair. I chairs, have. Fintech. Have. I was chair of the fintech committee. Of fintech the committee. And I remember you inviting me to come and have yeah. a conversation. I think it was during COVID. I think yeah. we were all virtual then. Yes. And I think you had made a very interesting point. Uh, and I think a number of your colleagues on on the committee uh, sort of echoed your, your sentiment, which was 
we still haven't found an eloquent and an effective way to communicate with the fintech community as a whole, right? Yes. So I think your point was on one-off basis as, as a bank, mm-hmm. yes, we're able to go find the two or three or 10, 15 fintechs we want to work with. But as the banking federation, we weren't able to. Has that moved on since then? Yes, so I, I, listen, I, I passed the bit on to uh, somebody else, but I think there was an active conversation and this has happened in other markets as well where the banks come together and almost create a charter or a yeah. sort of a you know, vision to say, uh, let's formalize the relationship in a more structured and a more committed way of what, what we, how we can partner with fintechs. Uh, I think it's still work in progress, to mm-hmm. be honest with you, I'm, I, unless my information is outdated. Uh, but I, I do know that that was being actively pursued uh, from a UBF perspective as well. Okay. No, well, that's good to hear because I, I think that that is a challenge. You know, uh, I, I work with a lot of fintechs in a number of different capacities, right? Uh, and, and I think they also struggle to say, you know, should we be creating some sort of a, a grassroots sort of voice of mm-hmm. of the ecosystem from a fintech perspective? And should there be more sort of formal, informal engagements with the banks where, you know, people can showcase, talk about collaborations, you know, so on and so forth. And it's not all about just marketing. Let's flip back to Rackbank, right? I think you, you mentioned microfinance. I think before we started the conversation, you, you mentioned something very interesting about what you're doing in payments. If I was sort of look at, you know, the next sort of three to four years uh, uh, or whatever horizon you're comfortable with in terms of Rackbank, what are you building out there? So what, what, is, so what are the interesting things you're doing? Yeah. Uh, as a bank, so so uh, culture. I said, so I won't go back into it. I, I think we are aiming to be the most personalized bank in the U.S. Okay, right. So we want to you. We want to uh, digital transformation. For me, seems pretty old and archaic now, right? I mean. If digital is transformation, then what, <laughs> why do we exist? But if someone says a digital bank, I'm yeah. like, you know, JP Morgan's yeah. uh, technology budget might be greater than the top 100 fintechs put together. So I think we're all going towards that. So, so I, think, I think that will happen, right? Yeah. I think we, 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 st- we feel uh, genuinely a lack of personalization here. I think there is still a lot of hard sell, particularly in the retail sector. So we want to become, A, the most personalized b- bank in the UAE. And I think we want to become, it's an aspiration. We may not get there. I know many other banks have the same aspiration. We want to be the undisputed leader in brilliant customer experience, right? Uh, Some of that will happen through technology. Some of that will happen through data. A lot of that will happen through our people, Mm -hmm. right? And I think we're building that. So that's, that's, if you, if you ask me what cuts through the organization, it's personalization and experience. Uh, Then you look at your portfolio of what you're doing. So, we we have four or five moonshots <clears throat> that we are building within the company, but they run like startups. But the good news is that you know they don't run out of funding, mm. or at least we. Are, but but we we actually evaluate them like startups. Yeah, that's what I was going <clears> to <throat> say. So we we give them a series of funding, we let them alone. They come back, then we say okay, and our, you know we have a board strategy committee which does that as well. So we get them bite sized funding. They come and show us progress. If it's promising, we let them go to the next stage. So we are building some th- some stuff. Some some of them are out there because they've now gone public. So Skiply is a great example mm-hmm. that we are building on. Uh, many are sort of still in the incubation stage or the build stage. Uh, so we think that we will come up with new way- <coughs> newer business models uh, and new things that we don't do today that will also happen. And the third thing that we are building is uh, is building a very solid corporate bank, right? So we were, as you rightly said, we were more a retail and a micro SME bank. We have been building our treasury capabilities. We have been building our corporate bank capabilities. And and now I think, you know, we, our, our corporate bank assets are almost as big as our business banking assets are. Mm-hmm. So we're doing that. Um, and we always continue to look out for, you know, we are a UAE-based bank. Uh, you know, uh, what what are opportunities that we look, look at outside UAE as well? But again, nothing concrete now, but we always keep exploring. I'm conscious of time. I I have two segments uh, uh, or two parts, uh, two questions, one to leave. We all talk about the positive side, you know, the Mm -hmm. opportunity. Right now, the macros are very, very favorable. There's more technology. Banks have more money than arguably ever before, relatively. What are the few things you need to be careful about as as banks today, right? You know, which could sort of lead to an existential event, right? Uh, which which could be for the whole sector 
uh, or a particular bank. Your thoughts on those? Yeah, so I think, I think listen, the, the uh, couple of things which I think I run through every bank CEO, uh, one is your data privacy and cybersecurity, mm-hmm. right? Um, cloud is here, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, UAE naturally is with, with the regulation, all the data has been brought back into the country, people have on-prem, uh, you know, but, but everybody is vulnerable, right? So you have to always stay ahead of the curve on that. And I think that's that's something that again goes back to trust. It goes back to reputation, and that's very important. It takes a day to break it. It takes decades to build it back. So I think that is that is there. Uh, credit risk and overextension of credit risk. Although I must compliment the central bank that they have brought in a lot of regulation, and again is also in the customer protection framework. There's a lot of regulation. But whether you are a large corporate, whether you are an SME, whether you are an individual, in this boom cycle, it is very easy to overextend, right? And I think banks have a responsibility to not sort of let you overextend, but also be the right partners and tell you how to be financially literate. We were just having a session in the afternoon on financial literacy. Even in the US, they say the financial literacy is at 34%, Mm -hmm. right? In UK, I think it was at 31 or 32 percent a few years ago. So financial literacy is 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 leads to overextension, leads to wrong decisions, then then leads to bad outcomes in a down cycle. Uh, so I think from that perspective, overextension of risk and ensuring your data privacy and your cybersecurity would be the two things I would worry most about. You worry most about it. Now, I, I'm, I'm sure my audience would not spare me if I did not ask a question regarding a regulator to a CEO of a mm-hmm. bank. You can always choose to take the fifth on this. It's not a pointed mm-hmm. question, nor is yeah. it loaded, right? So he, here's, he, here's the thinking and, 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 and hence the question, right? So um, uh, I'm, I'm older than I look just because I wear shoes which are colored <laughs> uh, or multicolored doesn't unfortunately do me any favors with age. You know, banks are very, uh, central banks are very simple. You know, they, they basically dictated, they defined and dictated your monetary policy and then sort of executed it through banks and other financial institutions, oversimplifying it, took care of the, the, the fiscal policy and, and sort of made sure the consumers were well protected, right? Yeah. The central banks of today, mm-hmm. and especially in our part of the world, have actually become, in my humble opinion, market makers. Right. Uh, They have gone into national public infrastructure. They are actually driving innovation. Right. So in the UAE, if you actually if I just cite two or three things. Mm -hmm. Right. There is the 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 launch of Ani. Right. uh, Which is quite an interesting. I had Jan Pilbor here last Mm -hmm. season. Uh, We had a very interesting conversation. Uh, We've obviously heard uh, recently about the announcement of the domestic scheme. Um, uh, And and then there's some very interesting stuff which is going around uh, with CBDC. Uh, yeah. both in terms of retail and wholesale. Uh, what's your take in terms of these initiatives from a bank's perspective, right? Uh, do you see them as wholly positive? Do you see these as, hey, this is actually creating some healthy competition for us, obviously, from, but coming from the regulator, so we need to do, th- do things differently. Uh, and specifically on the CBDCs, I just want to take your view from a bank's perspective on how you guys perceiving that sh- that sort of the emergence of CBDCs. Yeah. So, uh, listen, I think uh, I think largely very positive uh, on the central bank. I have, you know I'm part of the UBF. I think central bank is extremely consultative. Uh, so I uh, you know which 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 is. Which is uh, which is very pleasant, right? And uh, in many countries, you just get a regulation and then you comply with it. Here, I think on almost on everything that they do, there is proper consultation. You you sit down. They 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 take the views of the industry, sometimes the wider community, and and they genuinely incorporate feedback in it. Right? So I think that's very good. Um, I think again, going back to trust and reliability, uh, having some especially at the start of a new technology or a new platform, having the framework that, you know, it is designed for sustainability, it is designed in the right way, it is not being left to just market makers outside in a private industry to sort of build and do it on their own, uh, I think will lend credibility. Sure. Right? So I think from that perspective, I think it's it's pretty positive. Yes, it does it... Does it uh, you know, challenge sometimes our technology stack and how what we are developing and what is the priority and all. It does, right? I mean, because you naturally are trying to b- develop your own products and features as well. 
but I think positively uh, it's it's all good. On CBDC, I think listen, I think the way the central banks, I think uh, you know, the, naturally the crypto story is still is still uh, you know uh, out there, and I'm sure it'll get hot and cold. But I think genuinely having a digital currency uh, is is the future, and it will happen. And I think that would have been the right sequence to start with, right? You first come up with a digital currency that becomes an equivalent digital currency to your paper currency. And then you build on top of that on different use cases and what can be done with it. Uh, so I, I feel very positive about that. And I think uh, the banks should participate. We are participating. We were in the use cases on the CBDC with the central bank as well. And uh, we are looking forward to the digital currency coming into play. No, and that should be interesting, right? There are 140. I think there's a lot of opinions out out there on CBDCs. I, I personally have my own. I, I'm very, very gung ho on the wholesale side of it. Mm-hmm. I still have some questions in terms of the retail because I do think some of the problems it solves can be solved through other means, right? Mm-hmm. And again, th- there's there's this whole conversation I was having the other day. I was attending an ev- event organized over the weekend, which was. It's called Crypto Strategies for Business Leaders, which is quite interesting. But, you know, I, I argued the case for um, for basically uh, programmable fiat, mm. right? And I said, well, you know, you can solve all the problems with that. You don't really need the banks to do things very, very differently because the banks have a clear role to play. With CBDCs coming again, I do think there's a certain degree of re-engineering and re-education of the value chain, which would have to happen. Absolutely. Rahil, I've kept you very long. Uh, I really appreciate you coming in. Uh, uh, I have a bit of a surprise for you, which might be a positive surprise. Uh, this is going to be one of the first episodes, which is actually going to be published in three languages. So our show has been recorded in English. We're going to be using AI uh, with a bit of human touch uh-huh. that will actually do the entire episode in Arabic. And we've stress tested the 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 the. the the dialect or the tone, right. and I think it's come across very well. And it'll be your voice, by the way. So yeah. it'll be no one else's voice. We will, we will clone. And actually, also uh, in a combination of Hindi and Urdu, which sort okay. of allows us to get into the the Pakistan Indian scene too, because sure. I think there's a burgeoning sort of fintech scene out there, and there's a lot of sort of synergies. Yeah. So uh, we'll make sure that we, you get to see all of them. <laughs> Not that I, you know, when they were showing Arabic to me, I was like, hey, it sounds perfect, but I have no idea what I'm saying. But but you know, there you go. Use the technology. So even us small podcasters are starting to use technology to sort of, I guess, disseminate yeah. the voice. I'm I'm, I'm smiling because uh, on the national day. I did a English uh, speech and right. I did use AI to convert it into the Emirati dialect of Arabic. Excellent. And then I sort of uh, published let, it. Uh, didn't publish it, but it was it was on air on at the event uh, with with our colleagues, and I was asking them whether it looked real or not, and. I think many of them sort of believe that it was real. So no, no, so it's it excellent. Is, it, is, it is getting very, very good. It is. And we've worked and, you know, the production team has worked for well over two months on mm. this to get it right. Yeah. I, I'm fairly confident we will because, you know, our episodes are nearly 40 minutes. Sure. So we're actually going to run three channels. Uh, it's the first time we're trying it. But I think it's important that, you know, people get to hear what people, you know, guests like you have to share in a language that they're most comfortable yeah. hearing it. Having said that, thank you again. Uh, have a great week and a weekend, and uh, I'm I'm fairly certain my our paths will will cross again. So thank you. Absolutely, it's a pleasure to be with you, Arjun. Thank you.